where do you start with Norman? It is much more than Norman reaching his hundredth year and knowing and being part of so many seminal moments and working with all the different iconic people he has worked with, through in a really a century of show business. Uh, Norman, in looking at his career, he was an integral part of the great American theater movement that started in the 1930s, the group theater, the theater of action, the federal theater. Yes, Virginia, this government used to subsidize a theater. How about that? You think we've lost our way a little bit? Um, Alfred Hitchcock presents in the Alfred Hitchcock Hour, producer, director, and sometime actor. Uh, the Hollywood Television Theater, uh, the acting, uh, St. Elsewhere, Dead Poets Society, uh, he is still working. Uh, I, it's, it's impossible to sum up uh, what Norman has not only meant to all of us cynists and people that are here tonight, but what Norman Lloyd has meant to the popular culture of this country. This is Norman's evening. Uh, I couldn't be more pleased that he's here and you're all here. So enjoy Saboteur and then enjoy Norman between the films. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. For want of the stuntman, Davy Sharp, we, this night may not have happened. <laughs> he was your double. In, uh, in well, Davy scene. Sharp was the best stuntman around at that time. I may be unfair to the others, but they did name, instead of the Oscar for the best stunt of the year, they named it the Davy Sharp at that time. Right. They changed back to the Oscar thing. Yeah. But uh, Davy did that first fall into the, between the crotch, uh, the thumb and the forefinger, in the long shot, the fall. Davy did that in one take. It was exactly to the specifications of the Statue of Liberty. So he was falling actually that distance. Extraordinary. I'd like to point out that the backflip over the railing I did myself. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got to understand why I did it instead of a stunt man. One was working with the master, Hitchcock. He knew exactly what to do with a shot to have its, the reaction that he wished to achieve in telling his story. And he knew when I was being backed up by Bob Cummings with the pistol, that if he cut away from that and you saw in a long shot a fall, you say, oh, it's a double. But if you notice, he, Bob is coming at me with the pistol, and Hitch never cuts away, he stays with it. Oh, he, he did ask me <laughs> before we did the scene. He said, uh, do you think you could go over that railing? <laughs> I said, of course. I was 26 years old, I mean, so you could do anything. And they built up parallels 14 feet high right behind the railing with mattresses on it and it had a grip, I remember his name, Scotty, lying on his stomach waiting for me and when I went over I fell about five feet and Scotty caught me and kept me from rolling off and dropping the 14 feet. But it's an example of storytelling, that shot, that Hitchcock knew that he must never release in that shot the audience. You had to stay with that shot and not cut away. And the audience stays with it as a consequence. This was one of the many, many, many reasons he was such a master. He knew how to tell a picture story. 
How did you get the part? That was your first movie. How did Hitch select you for that for that role as a saboteur? It comes back to the Mercury Theater with Orson Welles and John Houseman. And I had been with the Mercury Theater and had gotten to know John Houseman very well in the course. He was the producer and Orson was the director. And uh, then uh, John Houseman left the Mercury and split away from Orson and he went to work for David O. Selznick. Hitchcock was under contract to David Selznick. And Hitchcock was on loan out for this picture, which was being produced by a man who is quite prominent in this town now in memory, Jack Skirball. Skirball, the top of the... the Skirball Center. Yeah, the Mall Mall. Island. Yeah. Hitchcock uh, was very friendly with Jack Houseman, who, as I said, was working for Selfie. They both were. So Hitchcock asked John Houseman one day while he was preparing the picture if he knew of a young actor who uh, might be of a villainous sort. <laughs> <laughs> Why John Houseman thought of me immediately, I do not know. <laughs> Although he once said, Norman, you're, you're very badly behaved. You have too much contempt for directors. But I didn't have it for Hitchcock. <laughs> this was John's distant observation. I adored Hitch. I admired him. He was wonderful. Did you... Even so uh, what he did is yeah. he recommended me to Hitchcock. I went to visit him at 8 o'clock in the morning at the St. Regis Hotel, where he'd like to stay. <laughs> and uh, had grapefruit with him. <laughs> and he said, well, yeah, hmm, we'll, we'll test you. So they did test me, and the result was I was cast. It was your first film later on when you started directing. I mean, having your first film with Hitchcock, what, if anything, there are probably a lot of things, but what are a couple of the main things that you picked up from Hitch in this movie that you later applied as a director when you directed? Let's see it, not talk about it. <laughs> Hitchcock, who started in silent pictures as an art director back in the 20s, always applied the rule which actually came from the silent picture days, you write with the camera. And he was a master of that. You had to visually capture it, don't talk about it. And one learned it here. This sequence has become very famous, if I may say so, not so much for the acting, but for the whole way it's visually laid out. And, uh, of course, the fall, that is a, is a great example of Hitchcock's perception and power as a director, what was necessary. And that was that when I felt it had to be from a big head close up without a cut to the bottom of the statue. Now, they didn't have the equipment in those days that you have today. So it required enormous ingenuity to evolve the sequence for that shot. And that sequence, the whole sequence, each stitch going one at a time, so that when Hitchcock ran the picture once for Ben Hecht, a very prominent writer of the time, 
He ran it, just the two of them alone in the projection room. When the lights came up, Hitch looked at Ben Hecht as if to say, well, and Ben Hecht said, he should have had a better tailor. <laughs> <laughs> What can you do with writers? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but this sequence, which has become, I hate to use the word iconic, but anyway. It's appropriate. <laughs> if you ever look at it again, you will see how it's laid out. And that how he builds to finally that big head's close up. And he knew if he cut away, it would not have the same effect. You had to stay with that head and see the whole body go down. To do that, they had to work out a very involved gymnastic system and uh, whereby I sat on a kind of stool uh, at the base of which was a cloth on which they were going to mat in, that is, paint in a, the bottom of the statue. This chair was on a sort of pipe. Right over my head was a platform with a large square hole in it. And looking down through this hole was a camera with a cameraman. The cameraman was Johnny Fulton. He was known as the best, as they said in those days, the best trick cameraman in the business. And when the cue came for me to fall, Johnny Fulton, with this camera pointing down at me, went up to the ceiling with the camera and the platform. It went to the ceiling, about 16 feet high. And as it did that, I did various beautiful balletic movements. <laughs> Simulating a fall. But I didn't fall at all. I just stayed there rivaling Nijinsky. <laughs> but the camera was going up to the ceiling. And then they did it several times to grind it at several speeds. They did about three or four speeds before they were able to find what was the most effective. Today they do that much simpler, but I won't go through that. When you came out, you were a stage actor, a New Yorker. And this was your second trip to Hollywood for Saboteur because Orson had you come out previously. Came out with Orson in 39. Yeah. And that was the beginning of Orson's troubles, but it was before Citizen Kane. Right. Uh, Heart of we Darkness. came out to do The Heart of Darkness. Right. And we were here for six weeks being paid, improving my tennis, <laughs> nothing happening. And finally, the studio said to Orson, no dice, we don't want to make it. Mm -hmm. And then they did. And years, it was made years later by Coppola. Right. Uh, you mentioned Apocalypse Now. Yeah, Apocalypse yeah. Now. Um. Uh, so that was my experience in coming right. out here. Right. Now, you mentioned Orson came out here, and that was the beginning of his troubles. And he and Hausman were together in the Mercury Theater. They came out here. Citizen Kane got made and released in 41. Uh, and you stayed very close to Hausman. What were, 
in your view, Orson's troubles, where he and Hausman split up, and then Orson's issues came. What was, what in your view brought that all about? Uh, I think that Orson's troubles, which were manifold in this town and later on, stem from the fact that he was a gigantic talent. In my view, the greatest talent we've ever had in the theater. Amazing what he could do in the theater. He would encompass you, so to speak. We, uh, we had very good directors on Broadway, absolutely first-rate people like George S. Kaufman, George M. Cohan, and so on. But not until Orson came along did we have anyone in the theater on Broadway who could equal and even surpass the great European directors like Stanislavski, Ara Brahm, and so forth, who were total in the way they encompassed an audience. So with Orson, you would go to a play and the script had been changed quite a bit, particularly Shakespeare, and uh, sound, lighting, music, the acting, everything totally encompassed the audience. And you were uh, thrilled with his production of Julius Caesar. And he could handle comedy as he did. But when he came out here, and he made what some people consider the finest movie, although you cannot really designate any movie as the finest movie. But he made Citizen Kane, it's a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> but when he, after he did Kane, then things, uh, he did Magnificent Ambersons and he never finished it and Robert Wise finished it, and then he did the thing down uh, in uh, South America on the, on the raft and all that. One guy drowned, and he never finished that. Hausman, who knew Orson better than anyone, and Orson did his best work with Hausman. You know, they did wonderful work before they came out here on the WPA, on the Federal Theater. Hausman said, unfortunately, Orson could not, had difficulty finishing things. Well, he finished enough things to cause a stir. But, you know, he, in this great talent, there was some strange remoteness holding back. I know I did a couple of things with him, Caesar, Shoemaker's Holiday, and it was always a kind of tension with all of You couldn't spot what it was, but while rehearsals were a great joy, he kidded around at rehearsals, joked at rehearsals. When we were accused in doing Shoemaker's Holiday, the actors, the principals, accused of not being disciplined enough and raising hell a little bit on stage. <laughs> one of the actors called for us to come down and discipline us. So one night we're doing the show and suddenly you feel moisture all over you and it smells like booze. You look around and Orson is standing in the wing with a bottle of Valentine Scotch and he's, as you come Close to the wing, you get a splash of scotch. <laughs> so you go around the other side, you get another splash of scotch. This was the discipline. <laughs> uh, he was his own man, and he had these things of his greatness. He had greatness as a director. Now, as I said, I always had 
a little kind of tension with Lawson. We disagreed on a couple of things, not radically, as a matter of fact, we resolved them. But you know, it was always that slight tension. And at the end, sort of, oh, years after the Mercury, the Directors Guild did a whole week of five days devoted to Orson Welles' work in the theater, in the Federal Theater, in films, etc., and radio. And I was asked to attend with Kenneth Tyne and the critic Orson's work, what Orson brought from the theater to films. And so we held forth on this subject. I, I personally thought it was a certain theatricality from the theater, a theatrical thing that he brought to films. And then it was over, the evening was over, and everyone shook hands, said goodbye, and so forth. And Orson saw me, and he embraced me in this great bear hug. And he whispered in my ear, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the relationship. <laughs> yeah. Back, back to Hitch, um, there came a time when uh, Hitch had his TV show and he asked you to direct and it was a team of you, uh, Joan Harrison, oh. and, and Hitch. Uh, talk a little bit about, because that show still in reruns and when I say Alfred Hitchcock Presents, I'm including the Alfred Hitchcock Hour that you also produced, but that show had an incredible run. It's still being shown today. Okay. And it's still, when I see it on Meet TV or someplace, I'll stop and I'll go, I remember that one and I'll sit there and watch it anyway, like The Jar, one of the, one of the great episodes that you directed. How did, how did the Alfred Hitchcock TV experience work, the, the teamwork between the three of you? It was originally put together by Lou Wasserman of, uh, Met, of uh, then MCA. Right. And he got hitched to agree to do it. <laughs> and it was Lou Wasserman who got hitched to agree to and suggested to Hitch that he put Joan Harrison on as his associate. They did that for two years. She was a brilliant woman, a marvelous producer, first rate in every respect. And they were doing this for two years. The whole show ran ten years. They were doing this the first two years, and they were doing 39 half hours a season. It was just too much. So while they kept up that rate of production, <laughs> it was decided that Joan needed an associate, and that they decided on me because of my relationship with Hitch, which had been very uh, healthy on this picture, Saboteur. So I came on as associate to Joan, and it existed that way for about five years. The show was then expanded to a, a, an hour, at which point I was made a producer with Joan also producing. And then she m married the superb writer of thrillers, Eric Ambler. And she wanted to ease back a little bit. Mm -hmm. So Hitch made me the executive producer and Joan just occasionally went in because she was con had to deal with the cooking. <laughs> uh, Hitch's influence pervaded the entire show. The show had to have suspense and a twist, had to have a twist at the end. And those two elements dictated the kind of stories we bought. 
And thus we did it a lot of, all, virtually all of Raoul Dahl's stories, and uh, Ray Bradbury, and Robert Block, and so on. The thing that Hitch wanted in those stories was to stay in the style of a Hitchcock story, which meant, as I said earlier, suspense and a twist. Occasionally, you could get him to agree to do another kind of story, but he resisted it, really. Mm -hmm. He wanted what I've described. Right. Segwaying into our second movie, another great director, Lewis Milestone. Um, talk about Millie Milestone, the man and the director, and then talk about how this A Walk in the Sun got produced. Very unique production if, that you told me about. Well, A Walk in the Sun, I'll cut to the chase. <laughs> Milestone was agreed to do this picture based on Harry Brown's book. Sam Bronston was the producer. We started shooting, and at the end of the first week, Sam Bronston didn't have enough money to pay the cast. And uh, Dana Andrews was just on this picture. He wanted to get paid. Yeah. And uh, as a result of that, uh, uh, Bronston was dropped as producer, and Milestone had to look around for money. So he kept shooting. He wasn't going to stop shooting. And he reached into his pocket at the end of the first week and paid the entire payroll, cast and crew, out of his own pocket. Meanwhile, he was searching around for backing. Now we're into the second week, and he's still searching, and we're still shooting, and it's a beautiful script and beautiful picture, but he hasn't got the money for the second week. He reaches into his pocket, pays the second week, and this is as far as he could go. When someone put him in touch with a fellow from who, how to put it delicately, knew a number of characters in Las Vegas. <laughs> Not only that, the character who represented them had a bar, the 19th hole on Melrose. And Millie met up with this fellow. And Millie had great charm, particularly he had a great rapport with men. He had done, of course, All Quiet on the Western Front, which is one of the genuine masterpieces ever produced in this town. So he knew how to talk to this particular fellow. And the fellow said, uh, yes, he would come in and uh, pick up the necessary change. Now, Walk in the Sun, as you will see, is about a young group of soldiers, 20, 21, the youngest group marching through this area in Italy. After this gentleman said he would come in with backing, suddenly I played the point on the squad, the guy out front walking. 
And I look back one day, and this young squad had aged. <laughs> they looked very much like a Las Vegas squad. <laughs> they were older, they were needed shaves. <laughs> Not beards, they just needed to be shaved. And they started a traveling crap game every morning before we started shooting. As a matter of fact, one day, Milestone got the game, more than one day. And he was, my favorite moment with that is he was shooting and he was behind 20 bucks, which 20 bucks meant a little more. And the assistant came up and said, we're ready for the shot, Mr. Milestone. And Billy said, get away from me, get away. <laughs> Give me the dice, come on. <laughs> he was buying 20 bucks, so we didn't start shooting till he got even. <laughs> anyway, this gentleman, I don't think it's a secret. He had been uh, in jail. He was the kind of fellow who said, you know, whenever I go to a bank, I leave the motor of my car running. <laughs> he was a gentleman who, the show needed $50,000 at a certain point, not at the beginning, but right. into it. Right. So he went up to the bank and he had $50,000, $51,000 bills. <laughs> And he put them down. The teller said, excuse me, sir, um, I have to find out where there's a governmental rule now, which still exists, it started with the war. Every time you deposit a thousand dollar bill, you have to explain the thousand, where you got it. Mm -hmm. So they said to Johnny, I have to explain where you got this 50,000, the thousand dollar bills. And Johnny said, I'm, I'm not telling you. <laughs> the teller said, I'm sorry, then I have to keep them. Johnny said, okay, he walked away. He left $50,000 in there. Rather than reveal where he'd gotten them. <laughs> uh, so with this, the picture got done, and then Milestone had to find someone to release it, correct? Well, yes. He had to find someone to release it, and he finally went to Daryl Zanuck. And the reason he went to Zanuck and felt he would get a break there, which he got, is that when Milestone, it was in the towards the end of the 20s, just before sound, Jack Warner said to Milestone, who had been the, one of the best cutters on the lot, I, I know they're now called editors, <laughs> but they were called cutters in those days, and uh, Milestone said to Warner, he wanted to do a picture, one direct. So Jack Warner said, okay, Who's going to write this? And Millie said, well, you know, there's this fellow who sits on the iron steps outside the stages and writes the Rin Tin Tin pictures. And Warren apparently was slightly taken aback by a, a writer on Rin Tin Tin writing a feature picture. So he said, well, who is this guy? And Millie said, Daryl Zanuck. His name is Daryl Zanuck. And he wrote that first picture for Millie. There was always, therefore, this relationship so that when Millie went to him with A Walk of the Sun, he gave it the release. Uh, it's a great picture and a, a really a fine cast. The Two of the stars that, uh, that, that really hold up well are Dana Andrews and Richard Conte, or I should call him Nick Conte, yeah. that's, that was his real. But I remember doing some research on Conte for something I wrote, and I found out that you apparently gave the eulogy at Richard Conte's 
uh, memorial, is that correct? You, you, you spoke at Richard Conti's memorial, is that correct? I spoke at his memorial. Yeah, yeah. What, what, talk a little bit about Dana and the type of person and actor he was, Dana and Nick Conte, because they're two of my favorites, I'm being selfish here. Dana was a remarkable man. He was a, he was a wonderful man. You could give him a page, solid page of dialogue. In the theater, I used to, I once did a play with Mark Connolly, and in rehearsals, he'd bring in new pages every day and say, your daily paper. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had this with Milestone, not to that extent, not to that extreme. But Dana could memorize a solid page in 20 minutes and not miss a word. He was incredible. He had a wonderful character. He was, I thought, a very fine actor. I mean, particularly in, uh, not only in our picture, but... Laura, Best Years of Our Lives, which is yeah. magnificent. Yeah. Yeah. So, Dana just had one problem. He could knock off a bottle of booze in short order. And sometimes that caused him to sleep late in the morning. So Milestone and I would, I would always drive out with Milestone, would sit waiting for him and the little girl, his daughter, would come running out and saying, Daddy is still sleeping. <laughs> so we didn't have to wait. But Millie loved him and he couldn't do he could do no wrong. And it, Millie used him all the time. Yes. Several pictures. Yeah. Nick Conte was a boy out of Jersey City whose father was a barber. And uh, Nick was a pretty good barber himself. Really? Yeah. And uh, Nick was very much of the streets. He was a terrific card player. And uh, he brought a great street quality to mm -hmm. what he played. But there was a sensitivity in Nick, almost not a feminine quality, but a very unique. Yeah. I'll tell you, we could, I could do this like the rest of the evening, Please. and I, I would like to, but we do have a second show. But before that, uh, we know that it was your birthday on November 8th. And it's a little after the fact, but I hope everyone will join me in singing Happy Birthday to North. So here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Norm. Thank you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the incomparable Mr. Norman Lloyd, and stick around for our second feature in a couple minutes. Thank you so much for coming.